So thank you for coming. Um, I know there's a huge number of conflicting voting talks on today. So um, if, you, if, you, if you're going to be leaving for the next one, um, I won't be offended at all, please. Um, thanks for coming for the start. So this is joint work with Lee Rong. I hope many of you um, were at Lee Rong's talk on Monday last week, because I think that would be a fantastic introduction to what I've got to talk about. Um, if you weren't, hopefully I'll say enough um, to let you in on, in on some of the ideas. Um, but I really uh, would welcome, um, want you to interrupt me with questions all the way through the talk. So please do that. Um, so this is joint work as well with Lee Rong. So, um, um, I want to talk about um, electing the Doge. Uh, for those people who are going to be leaving shortly, here's the executive summary. Um, we study the impact, the very positive impact, of, um, as you'll see why, why, why this makes any sense, of, uh, of having a, uh, a randomized pre-round to any election where you actually eliminate some of the voters. Now, that will sound very strange. Um, and let, you, let me argue from a historical and uh, normative and, and, and uh, computational perspective why that, was, uh, that might be an interesting um, idea to entertain. Okay, so um, electing the doge. The doge is, uh, if you like, the Italian word for duke. He is the highest elected official in the Venetian Republic. And um, uh, the Venetian Republic, of course, was a really, um, you know, a power, an economic powerhouse in, in, in Europe in the, in the Middle Ages, where they were going out and exploring the world and bringing back uh, the riches from, from all over, from China and everywhere else. Um, and um, the Venetian Republic has a very powerful uh, navy, and, and uh, um, the Doge was right at the, the, the pinnacle of this organization. Um, this uh, is uh, Leonardo Loridum. He was the Doge from 1501 to 1521. Um, and that picture you might recognize from the poster. Um, actually, a little art history aside now. This, this the, the doge was really important, really a, a, a big fish. Um, and this, just to illustrate how important from an art history point aside, this is probably one of the very first, if not uh, art historians uh, consider it to be probably the first portrait of a mortal being who was not in profile, right? He's, he was so important that he was actually, uh, it was good, he was, like the gods that they were painting, not in profile, they would paint the doge, not in profile. And this is uh, arguably the first non-profile portrait of a mortal. So um, there was a, I'll talk about it, a very complicated uh, voting rule used to elect the doge uh, based upon this idea of randomly selecting uh, people from the electorate. Um, but I want to argue that actually it's, it's turned up in another a number of other settings. It was an interesting um, meme of its of medieval time because um, many other Italian city-states adopted uh, similar sorts of rules of, with their own flavor but with a, a very similar sort of form. And um, the rule itself is, is it's arguably one of the longest running electoral systems that we know about. It was used for 500 odd years from 1268 um, to 1797 when they stopped electing the Doge. Um, and I think, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, it, it's fair to say it's probably the most complex voting rule ever used. Right? It involves 10 rounds of voting. You, I, I'd be happy to hear if you're going to disagree with my, my uh, thesis that this is probably the most complex electoral system ever used. So let's see. Let's see if you're going to agree with me. Um, actually, I, I just got a, a couple of quotes here. Uh, from, from some papers, um, one, an old, very old one, uh, uh, no, this, this, the date's completely wrong, I've, I've typed this on the keyboard, it must be 1988 or something, I think it must have, my fingers were typing ahead of my brain, I don't think it's, the quote was that old, um, yes, I'm sure it was a 1988 quote, not, ni not 1899, <laughs> uh, but this is such an old talk, you never know, right? So, but there was uh, an observation by, by, in this paper saying that the main idea of, the, of this rule to elect the Doge seems to have been to introduce a system of election so complicated that all possibility of corruption should be eliminated. And we'll actually look at, with a mod, very modern perspective in terms of computational complexity, whether that's true or not. 
Uh, some other people, other authors have, have cited one way or the other. Um, this is a nice quote which seems to contradict itself, um, act, suggesting that the rule is one in which actions which do not increase security, but which are designed to make the public think that the organization carrying out the actions is taking security seriously. But then uh, later on in the next page, they say it offers some resistance to corruption of voters. So I'm not sure that they have completely decided themselves. OK, so let me, let me show you the rules so you can decide for yourself. So there are about 1,000 uh, males of uh, suitable age who are allowed to vote in the election. They're the, 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 the wealthy people of, of, of the Venetian Republic. I'm um, afraid women weren't allowed to vote then, and you had to be, I think, over 30 to vote as well. Um, so it begins with a lottery, where they pick out of that 1,000 people who are eligible for, to, 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 to vote 30 individuals. Okay, so that's the first step. That's the, the randomly deleting some people, so 970 people get deleted. <laughs> the second round is they take those 30, and then they have another lottery to reduce those people to nine. So it's not obvious. No one seems to know it. Uh, historians don't seem to understand, have a very good explanation of why they didn't do this in one step, other than trying to divide a thousand people into nine is more difficult than to divide them into 30 and then 30 into nine, just because randomly drawing numbers is perhaps easier if you break it into parts. But it's not obvious why they did it in two steps, other, other than that. It was just easier before you had computers to, to, to do that. Okay, and now we get into round three. Don't forget there are 10 rounds to come, so we've got a long way to go yet. So round three is those nine people then get to vote using an approval style voting for 40 more people. Right, so 40 people out of the 100 who are, who are going to go through to the next round. What happens in the next round? Well, it goes on for a sequ sequ sequence of where uh, those 40 people get reduced by lot to some smaller number. That smaller number of people get to increase the size of the electorate um, and so on until we get to the 10th round where there are 41 people standing. And now they use uh, some, some, some uh, form of plurality uh, to uh, finally elect the doge, who's represented here by the penguin. Um, so just to summarize, there were 1,000 people in the electorate, the males 30 years and older. Um, they were first reduced by lot to 30, then 9. Those elect 40. Those 40 then reduced randomly by lot to 12. Those elect 25. Those 25 are reduced by lot randomly to 9. Those then elect 45. That 45 are reduced by lot randomly to 11. Those 11 then elect 41. And those 41 elect the Doge. You might think this would take a long time to happen. It does, in fact. Um, they were actually locked in the palace in Venice until they completed this process. Uh, yes, uh, good, good question. Um, this is only a very simplified description. <laughs> You'll be pleased I saved you the complicated details. Uh, so they had various rules about whether, who they could vote for. Um, so there were two restrictions uh, on the voting. One was that, um, that when uh, we were reducing people by lottery, they didn't want the lottery to be unrepresentative. And families are very big in Italy as, uh, then as now. So only one person in each family was allowed to be selected in each lottery. So once uh, your family had been represented in one lottery, they were taken out. Um, and another one is that um, we had um, electoral colleges of size 9, 11, and 12. So, uh, so 9, 9, 11, and 12. And none of those people um, were allowed to be members of the final 41. So if you elected them, you used, up, used them up. Right, so you, um, and um, I said it was approval like voting to enlarge the, the electoral college. Um, the system changed a little bit over time. It was at 1.40 in the final round, but then they had a tie one year. So they made it 41 the next time. So they would never have a tie. Um, so I hope you would agree it really is a good candidate for being the most complicated electoral system you will have ever seen. Um, then there, there are two features that, that uh, stand out to me, at least when I looked at this. One is the first is this idea that you're throwing away some of the voters. You're using a lottery to eliminate some of the voters. Um, and the other is that um, you notice that, that in many steps of the, of the procedure, you're not voting on the doge. You're voting on other people 
who themselves will go through and, and vote on other people and eventually will vote for the doge. Right? So you're not actually voting for the person you want to win, you're voting for some proxy who's going to do the voting for you. Um, so this talk I'm going to talk about the first feature and try and abstract that away. Um, but that's not to exclude. I think the second feature is actually also very interesting. And another aspect of the, of the voting role that itself would deserve um, more study. And that's um, something that Leverong and I are thinking about at the moment. And OK. So to sort of abstract that and to get a, I mean, obviously, we can't study that voting rule. It's just too complicated to, to begin to study that voting rule. Let's, let's abstract it a bit and start with something that we can study in a much more formal setting and, and understand the properties, the normative properties, the, the manipulability of, uh, and so on. So we're going to start with um, uh, a family of voting rules that we call lot then x. Uh, and the idea, x is your favorite voting rule, border, approval, uh, majority, whatever you like. Um, you run a lottery, that's the lottery, and then picking some subset k, you, you tell me what k is fixed perhaps um, in advance. You run a lottery to pick some subset of the k voters, and then those k voters uh, apply, you, you apply perhaps on their preferences the um, voting rule x. So if you like, the Doge election was using several rounds of lot then approval in some sense. And we do a lottery, then we approve and, and repeat. OK, um, just a little more about why this is interesting. Actually, lot, lot the next does turn up in a lot of other settings than the ones I've already said. I already mentioned the other Italian cities. Um, one of the oldest offices in the Russian Orthodox Church, this is the uh, Archbishop of Novogorod. Um, he was um, elected in a way that with a, with a lottery then, then followed by a proper vote and amongst whoever of the electorate was left. Um, of course, this really is, if you think back, it sort of goes right back 2,000 years to Athenian democracy. I mean, they were actually used lotteries to select uh, out of the, 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 the citizens um, the people who are going to be making decisions for them. So really, this is a very old idea. Um, and it's in use today, right? It's an old idea. I don't want you to think it's not uh, a new idea. Um, the Internet Engineering Task Force. This is the standards body that uh, thinks about TCP, TCP IP and various other internet protocols and works closely with ISO on, these, on, on setting these standards. Um, that uses an election for its chair, uh, which does exactly this. Um, there are about 100 plus um, people in the electorate. In fact, I mean, anyone could um, express interest in, in the uh, working of the Internet Engineering Task Force. But there's about 100 people who, are, who, who do um, uh, get interested in this. Out of those, they randomly select a subset of 10 of them every two years. Um, and those 10 people get together and, and discuss who would make a good chair. And Russ Hoosley is the current chair at the moment. Uh, who was elected by these 10, who were randomly chosen out of the 100. Can yes? Can you explain why they gave these chairs? Did they use any justification for them? Uh, well, yes. Uh, well. I mean, they should know that over the internet you can, you can do voting on 100 people. You can. I think uh, in this case, the reason is um, they want people, uh, well, the problem is the 100 people may not be very well informed as to uh, the, 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 the exact expertise that the different candidates have. And the committee can go away and, and look at it more, the de look at the issue in more detail, more thoroughly, and make a good decision for you. So you're delegating responsibility. There's the, I mean, there are a number of reasons. That I, I that's what I believe in this case from what I've read. Um, uh, I'll get onto the reasons in one, one second. I just mentioned a couple of other examples, just so you know that lot based voting is used in other uh, settings. Um, they decided that they wanted to try and reform um, how they voted in British Columbia in 2004. So they l used a lottery to select a subset of the people in British Columbia um, who then voted on electoral reform, decided a new voting rule for British Columbia. Um, if you're curious, they decided on S this Citizens' Assembly decided on STV. Uh, it was a contagious meme again. So in Ontario, they thought this was a good idea in 2006 when they 
they were thinking about electoral reform, so they had a citizens' assembly. Again, selected by lottery, then they voted on um, a new form, of, a proportional um, um, member system for Ontario, which was then put to the whole electorate who rejected it. So it didn't work so well that time. And um, there's a few other places you can find it around the world. Um, a number of Spanish savings banks elect uh, committees that, that represent the account holders by randomly selecting some of the account holders who then vote for people who are going to sit on the bank's committee to represent their interests. And a number of people who presumably um, think it has useful properties have selected, have suggested it might be a good way to reform the British House of Lords, uh, I'm originally British, or even your US House of Representatives. So um, to, now to answer your question, what, why would you use this? So there are a number of arguments people have put forward for using lotteries like this within a, an election system. Uh, one is that clearly it is representative, right, in some sense. You, you, you are uh, uh, being represented. It's, it's egalitarian. Everyone gets a, has a chance of turning up. Um, there's arguments that it's less corruptible. Um, you know, you can't, you can't go and spend lots of money bribing people because it's going to be anyone from amongst your midst. Um, it does give power to the ordinary, per ordinary person, um, something perhaps uh, that is uh, relevant to the US setting is that you don't have many rounds of voting and voter fatigue and so on. You just randomly select the people and off you go. And perhaps a beautiful aspect of it is you don't have political parties naturally in the system. Right? It's in individuals who are being elected. So it's not, maybe you escape some of the problems that political parties introduce. There are, of course, arguments against as well. Um, I, th I think one of the arguments against is that uh, the people selected by the lottery may themselves not be very um, uh, qualified. Um, you can select people who have very minority views. Um, these people are not necessarily um, so accountable. Um, and um, another issue which is actually relevant to the internet, uh, to this, uh, uh, to the case of uh, the, the chair here is um, you have to, the result depends on the quality of your randomness. And so do you trust the randomness? So in fact, there's a, a standard being, being issued to, 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 to ensure the verification of the randomness used in the lottery. OK, um, but in this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on some of the normative properties. And, and one of the big properties is, um, does it actually, does it, going back to that quote, is that does it, does it really give a sense of um, uh, prevention of uh, manipulability or not, or is it merely a, merely a charade? Um, and hopefully those of you who are at Liron's talk at the, on Monday last week will, will um, have heard him talking about how there's been an interesting body of work in computational social choice looking at, well, we can't escape Gibbard Satterwaite's theorem. We can't escape the fact that all voting rules under reasonable assumptions, very modest assumptions, are going to be Manipulable will be stuff. Will, will there be strategic voting? Will be will make sense in some situations, but if that strategic voting is computationally hard to to compute, then maybe voters are just going to not have the resources or not have the energy to actually compute manipulations, and so we'll do vote truthfully. So there's an interesting body of work that's been going on actually for 20 years now, looking at the computational complexity of of manipulation. And so I'm going to look at the computational complexity of, of these sorts of voting rules. Um, just to point out, I mean, of course, there's, 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 there's some previous work in this area. Perhaps the closest is um, Gibbard's work on thinking about randomized voting rules. This is a randomized voting rule, right? There's a source of randomness in there. Uh, he proved that with three or more candidates, um, any randomized voting rule that satisfies three to optimality is a random dictatorship. And you can see that here. If k equals one, if the size of the lottery is one, we are selecting a random dictator. Right, so you can see that coming out naturally here. But of course, we're also thinking about where k is, k is bigger. Um, and there's been interesting work, uh, a body of work done starting by um, uh, Thomas and, and, and uh, Vince, um, looking at uh, adding a pre-round before the election where some candidates are eliminated. Here we're looking not at the candidates being eliminated, but the voters being eliminated. And the nice uh, symmetry there is that they found that by eliminating some of the, candid uh, some of the candidates, you could make some of these voting rules uh, computationally hard to, to manipulate when they weren't without this pre-round computationally hard. And we'll 
see some, some sim similar things here when we eliminate the voters, not the candidates. OK, just a, a, a little thing about uh, uh, some of the normative properties. The nice thing is many normative properties of lot than x are inherited from x. So if you're anonymous, neutral, strong monotonic, weak monotonic, or unanimous, then uh, if x has those properties, then lot than x has those properties. That's nice. The disappointing, unfortunate one is Condorcet consistency. If x is Condorcet consistent, if, if there's a Condorcet winner and x always elects them, unfortunately lot than x may not be. And it's easy to see why. Your lottery may throw out the person who is critical to having a Condorcet winner. And, and so you may lose um, Condorcet consistency. Um, and, and the other direction, if you have, if lot than x has any axiomatic property, then trivially um, x will also have an axiomatic property. But I want to focus more on um, thinking about manipulation. And the first, uh, first step on thinking about manipulation is just thinking about who's gonna, who can possibly win. Um, why possibly? Possibly because we're going to run a lottery. So there's, there's a, 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 it's only a probability that we can know what the outcome is. Right? So each candidate will win with some, some probability, depending on the outcome of the lottery. So there's a, a decision problem that we can frame, which is um, a very simple one. Can a particular candidate win with some probability strictly larger than, than P? Right, so there's a decision problem about the probabilities that, that candidates are going to win. Um, after who, who, depending on who gets through the lottery, um, and then we apply the voting rule. Just point out, computing the winner in any one instance is easy. Right? We're assuming that x is easy, the voting rule of x is easy. So um, the, the difficulty here might be with the fact we've got to consider all the possible outcomes of the lottery. Right? That's the only difficulty. Once, we've, once I know the outcome of the lottery, it's easy, easy to apply the rule. So um, putting this lottery in front of the election uh, can introduce some complexity just working out who can potentially win. Uh, for example, uh, if you take a, a rule like border, then um, of course it's easy to predict who's going to uh, know who's going to win a border election, but to evaluate uh, whether some candidate wins with some probability p or greater of lot than border is np hard. Um, and if we want to know um, the exact probability that they win, um, actually you can reduce it to a counting problem, it's hash p complete, the, the, the counting class that's analogous of uh, NP hardness for decision problems. So we can see that we start to get some complexity. Um, you can show this for other voting rules, lot than Copeland, lot than Maximin, lot than ranks pairs. Um, all of those uh, computing uh, whether a, a candidate can win with some probability are NP hard. So just to remind you, Copeland is... I don't think we know. I don't think we know. It's an interesting question. We don't know. One couldn't, uh, I wanted to mention, one couldn't like, simulate it in some way and try to get it. Sim simulate which? Uh, simulate the uh, voting system, including the random, you know, do the, uh, some way simulate the lottery. Uh, you, yeah, you do some sort of Monte Carlo sampling and, and converge with, with some error bounds, yeah. potentially. I think it might depend on the voting rule. Yeah. I don't think you can. Yeah. In all interesting questions. I'm not sure that it manipulates you to be able to evaluate. They need to yeah. So, the, fine. so just, just answering evaluation doesn't really tell us directly about manipulation. And the next couple of slides I come to manipulation itself. So just because computing this probability is hard doesn't tell us that we can't, uh, can't do better without knowing what the probability is. You're, you're very right. And we'll come to that issue in, in one second. So I don't know if, if people uh, need to be reminded what Copeland, the maximum and rank pairs are. Um, uh, they're, they're 
Uh, Copeland and, and Maximin are both uh, rules where you can construct a score depending on the pairwise wins or the difference between uh, the difference between scores and pairwise wins, and um, uh, either um, add them up or look at uh, the, uh, the Maximin, or ranked pairs where you're constructing a, uh, an ordering by taking the pair taking pairs of candidates in turn and ordering them until you can't until transitivity forces you to order them in the opposite way. So that's ranked pairs. Um, with small elections, what happens with small elections to here? We had to allow those NPR misresults. We had to allow the number of candidates to grow. Um, well, with small elections, of, of all of these things are easy unless you have weights on the votes. In this case, if we have weights on the votes, we can get hardness even in small elections. Um, even for lot than approval with just two candidates. And so you can immediately work out um, there was a reduction there, uh, assuming p not equals p, there's a reduction from subset sum. Since that was with two candidates and approval on two candidates is the same as majority, that tells us that even majority, something as simple as evaluating whether lot the majority, who, who the, what probabilities, uh, whether you can win with a certain probability with lot the majority is not in p for two candidates if we have weighted votes. Um, so does it make sense to use a voting rule where Evaluation is hard. I mean, I think that's a point of discussion, really. Uh, probably not a problem for the truthful voters. They're going to do. Uh, um, but I just m make this observation. This is different than sorts of people, some of the voting rules like Dodgson's rule and certainly Kemeny's rule, where deciding the winner is not in P. So, um, here, deciding the winner is in P. We can run the rule at any point. It's just the fact that the rule has a, um, a probabilistic outcome that is causing the problem. Okay, and but now to go to your question, which is that um, just evaluating probabilities of who's going to win isn't doesn't tell us directly about manipulation. We may be able to compute manipulations even if we can't don't know what those probabilities are, right? So we looked at um, two uh, decision problems. The first one is looking for a um, what we call a fixed manipulation. So we're given the other voters' votes. We're given some candidate who we want now to win, and some probability. And can we cast a fixed vote, uh, of, you know, a vote independent of the lottery, um, to make our candidate win with some probability greater than p? So that's the first one. But I think what probably you want more, probably what more appealing to you is the next one, which is an improving manipulation, where we we don't worry about what the probabilities are. We just say, can we cast a vote that will increase the probability? So we, can we do something strategic? And this is assuming you're going to get preference for each other. Or assuming you're going to get both. Yeah, so this is the standard setting that people in computational social choices. This is um, looking at the, the case where we have complete information. Of course, we might not have complete information. The argument people often put forward is, well, if it's hard when we have complete information, if I have probabilistic information, it's only going to be harder, right? This is a special case, right? So we're assuming complete information about everyone, how they, how everyone else has voted. Um, and now we're saying, can we improve the probability that we win? We don't care what the probabilities are anymore. Um, so that's what we call an improving manipulation. It's, that's, again, a decision problem. Is there a, a way to strategically vote to improve the result? Um, so uh, what do we know? For lot then polarity, it's easy. You just vote for the guy you want to win. It's still the same as usual, right? That one wasn't difficult. Well, that's not so surprising. Um, but we still don't know what it is um, to compute uh, fixed manipulation where you give me a probability. I want to, this guy to win with 50% chance. Uh, we think that's going to be an NPR problem. It's, we certainly haven't been able to come up with any polynomial looking algorithm. Um, if we bound the number of candidates and the number of manipulators, then there is a, a, a polynomial method. Um, Provided X, the voting rule X is anonymous. If it's an anonymous, then we can summarize the, the vote in a, in, a, in a simple way and we can actually compute the manipulation polynomial, whether it's a fixed manipulation or an improving manipulation. Um, but in general, um, if we don't bound the number of uh, candidates and bound the number of manipulators, uh, or bound the number of candidates at least, all of these, uh, lots of these problems turn out to be hard. So with lot then border, um, either a fixed or an improving manipulation is NP-hard even if there's only one person doing the manipulation. Even for that one person on their own to work out how to vote strategically is NP-hard. 
uh, and just an observation, um, throwing in the lottery before doing the border, border rule has now in increased the complexity because this case is polynomial with one manipulator. Manipulating border, it's polynomial. The, a greedy algorithm will compute the manipulation for border. Um, and a recent result, um, ourselves and some other people in AAAI and Ijikai respectively, um, proved that a, a long-standing open problem, which is it only becomes NP-hard to compute a manipulation for border if you have two manipulators and they have to work together. But with one manipulator, which is this case, uh, it's polynomial for border. So by throwing in the lottery, we've actually reduced the number of manipulators in which we get complexity. Um, some other cases, lot than STV. Um, uh, STV is NP hard to manipulate itself, and similarly, not surprisingly, when we put a lottery in front, uh, it does the same. Uh, lot then rank pairs, again with a single manipulator. Lot then Copeland with a single manipulator. Uh, there's a complexity result for second order comp Copeland. So, um, and lot then Maximin. Um, and again, uh, Lee Rong, I think it was in your thesis, I don't, proved that Maximin was. Uh, NP hard if we have two manipulators but polynomial with one. But uh, sorry, yes, rank pairs the same same case. So so again we've reduced the number of manipulators. One person on their own still to, to vote strategically now becomes NP hard. So we have definitely, in a worst case sense, in increased the complexity. Um, and just to step back, um, to think we've got several methods now. We know of several methods now where we can make manipulation of voting rules computationally harder. I mentioned one at the start where this work that Thomas and Vince started where you have a pre-round where we eliminate some of the alternatives. That's one method we know about. Um, Multi-stage voting seems to be a good, uh, a good source of complexity. Um, you can think of STV as, as um, multi-stage um, plurality each time you Yes, multi-stage plurality. Um, there are multi-stage versions of border rule, Borders Rule. They're called Nansen, Nansen's and Baldwin's Rule. Um, and we recently showed that, that um, by throwing in a multiple stage, uh, we, can in, we can increase the complexity with uh, one manipulator. Um, there's been some work on looking at the tie-breaking. You can get complexity out of the tie-breaking alone. Um, and um, we looked at some work where if you can restrict the amount of information that, that, that the manipulators have, if they don't have complete information, we, we only allow them to have a limited amount of information. Uh, for example, you know, the current winner or the, the, the current scores that the candidates have got, we can then make it hard for you to work out how to do something in a, in a safe way that will manipulate the result. Um, and then what I talked about here, the final way, if we randomly eliminate some of the voters, then we can make it difficult for you to manipulate the result. So does, does this work here even if you eliminate one person at random? Yes, I try to remember which of the reductions. Some of the reductions were with, as I remember, one or not all of the reductions, but some of the reductions were with just one, with, with so just eliminating one, one voter. Guess, um, some of these reductions used more than one, though. Yes. Take people out, and so there's some kind of trade-off between loss of informativeness and increase in the manipulability. But there were there were no sort of answers or questions there. But mm -hmm. I'm thinking those kinds of trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely interesting question. So just to summarize, um, so we started thinking about the family rules, lot, which we call lot then x inspired by these Venetian elections. And then, as I said, you can actually see them in, in a number of other, you can see this idea of having a lottery and, and then perhaps followed up by a, another voting rule in a number of uh, settings even used today. Um, the, we looked at some computational problems around winner determination and manipulation. And in both cases, we saw um, that we could increase the, that the comp computational complexity uh, would, would frequently increase um, future work. I think the other aspect of the Venetian election is really interesting to look at, to think about how you're voting for a subset of yourselves who then go on to, 
to, to decide the issue itself. Um, and it would be lovely to have you know, complexity results uh, to understand better the 10 round Venetian rule, to understand really um, what goes on with this particular rule. I think that's a, that's a safe guess. So thank you, and I'll end with the picture of the Doge. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we haven't thought about it. Um, can you tell me a little more about how this how this works? What, what the context of this? Well, the, the mediation process is you know two litigants. Oh, I see. So these so representatives who then get together and select someone else. Okay. Who will also serve on so now you have three people in the pie. Yeah, it could be a multiple. Uh -huh. um, but you could. So this is a non-random process. Yes. It, it, very interesting questions. I mean, you see that in, in slightly in the Venetian election because they go through these periods of reduction and, and enlargement, reduction and enlargement, reduction and enlargement, reduction and enlargement, the doge. Uh, <coughs> so yes, I think those would be interesting to understand what that adds to the process, what properties that that, that, that has and, as a process. I mean, this, the rule was too complicated to understand all parts of it at once, so we had to take out one feature and start that. There was another question there. So I think a lot of this work on the so part of this result is really cool, but has really good question brought up. Do you know of work that does more either average complexity results or just experimental results to try to figure out in practice if I just do the obvious thing, like if most people that want higher and most people that want don't want lower, how well does that work? So yes, so there has been some work, I mean, much less work than on than the worst case results. I mean, there has been some work. Liron's done done some work there. The, as you say, part of the problem is you have to make some assumptions, typically very strong assumptions about um, what sort of profiles you're getting. You know, people assume impartial anonymous culture. You know, purely uniform profiles and things like this, which is you know potentially not not too meaningful. Um, the average case results that they get under those sorts of assumptions tend to tend to suggest a lot of easiness. Right. Uh, very small regions in which uh, there could be any complexity, and um, those small regions are regions in which the elections can be hung. Right. Right. Um, and it turns out most elections easily go one way or the other, and um, one of you know I, I, unless the unless the uh, the manipulating coalition is a significant size, they are not going to change the result, whatever they do. Um, and where they can the re change the result, typically greedily doing the obvious thing will change the result now. Um, so there have been some experimental work. Um, uh, actually, I have two papers. Uh, most of the experimental work was done by me, I think. <laughs> uh, so I had two papers, um, one at Ichikai two years ago and one at Ikai last year, looking in practice, so you can actually, you know, you can take samples of real elections. I took, I took a number of real elections and looked at that and, and saw that, you know, unless the elections were, were critically hung, you wouldn't get any complexity and, and simple methods would typically find them. We, um,
Well, the, so just, uh, just 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 to just to put some 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 meat on those those arguments. So, for example, I was one one of the places I was looking at STV, and I showed her the nest. The, unless the election was was constructed to be essentially hung. You didn't get any complexity. It was hung, you got complexity if if, it, if you constructed elections randomly so that they were guaranteed to have, to have a hung result. But then, if you took one of those hung elections and you threw in one voter who was just voting randomly, it then became trivial to work out the, whether you could manipulate the result or not. The presence of one voter was enough to stop the vote, the vote being hung. The, the problem now became trivial. So it was that, you know, that's how precisely hung you had to be. Um, in terms of should we think about this in, in practice, I think the, the place that this all has any concern is in medium-sized committees, right? If we're thinking about electing the next president of the United States, you cannot assemble enough people together to have a manipulating coalition, right? You're not going to change the result. Uh, with you know, Maybe going to change the result if you've got a couple of million to throw at an advertising campaign, but you're not going to, by, by getting individuals to vote differently, personally going to make probably make much of a change. <laughs> If you've got a faculty committee getting together to make some tenure decisions, to think of an example, <laughs> uh, you might have a fair idea of exactly how your colleagues are going to vote. Um, it could, because it's a small election, it could easily be quite hung. There could be two people. You could have a significant inf influence on the result by strategically playing people off against each other. Yes. Which were perceived to be defective somehow. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, you know, was the n minus one vote chamber viewed as a defective? How would you go to the voting process? Uh, I I don't know a huge amount. I mean, they did add, add rounds. They did change the numbers. You know, you wonder what, what were the numbers chosen because you know they they have no prime factors or you know what was there a mathematical <laughs> reason for these numbers? I think there were there, there were clearly probably some socio. Uh, socio-economic issues that the numbers were designed to reflect the number of um, families. Uh, this, uh, you know, Venice is divided into various districts. We need Yeah, I think they threw in, threw in rounds to do this. And they also, some of the numbers were chosen to, to make sure that the families all felt they were represented. Uh, you know, so. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to discover if the number of families was, you know, uh, was of the order of 40, 40 or, or, or 20 or so. Well, you've got to remember these things evolve and who put them in place were the people who were previously in power. <laughs> so um, you know, some of it may be theater, some of it may be. Yeah, so I mean, we, we've been assuming here that the, that the lottery happens and the votes are fixed. Uh, but you, you know, in the case of electing the chair of the Internet Engineering Task Force, you know, people say, oh, you know, I'm going to vote in this way, but you don't actually get to know in the pri privacy of the committee room how they actually voted. So they can actually, there's lots of, there's, yes, definitely. Um, there's definitely more opportunity for strategic behavior because now it's a smaller committee. You can. Did you see like uh, lotteries being used in the way where like you force people to commit to their votes and then you flip who the correct test they chose it was, and then you use that as the as the result? Both are interesting, I think, to consider. Uh, we see both in both both in pra both in practice. I mean, in fact, the second we see perhaps more often than we see the first, where you you elect a committee and then the committee supposedly represent your interests, but they have their own agenda. Both. I was so interested in David's question earlier about being able to know voters and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So you're um, targeting this result of you know the complexity of things with voters or increased alternatives to the issue, but um, it seems likely that if you you know we're eliminating ten voters versus two n voters, you would see a huge jump in complexity to manipulate it to eliminate more voters at that rate of speed. So do you, do you think that's true? Did you look at that? Um. Well, if you see a complexity result where you where it's you only need to eliminate one, then trivially it sort of holds for even more because you might just fall into the case where all the other people that you eliminated were irrelevant. So, but I think if you think about average case, oh, average case will be different. If you think if you just if you if you're thinking of worst case, you're not you're not. Kind of, kind of, kind of sounds to me that what you might see in an average case sense is you should see some some smooth sense where things get harder and harder to. Obviously, if you're just going to focus ultimately on one person, it gets trivial again. A random dictatorship. It seems like there's a sweet spot. Where yes. Yeah. You have maximum average case. You know, this is just yeah. Case. Square root of n. Right. 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 My right. guess. Right. 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 Right.